So I'm going to give, go a little bit off script today. I just talked at Zeitgeist yesterday. And <clears throat> I, I, I have to give you a tiny bit of the moonshot thinking uh, spiel. You heard a little bit of it there. And then I'm going to go off script because I was sort of thinking yesterday because of a question that I got at, at Zeitgeist. So uh, Google X, which is a part of Google, is focused on moonshot thinking. That's an ethos. It's a way that we approach problems. And I'm evangelizing moonshot thinking because I don't think that it's particular to Google X. I think that there is something that is working for us that can work for everyone. And moonshot thinking is not the kind of thing you hog to yourself. The world has so many enormous problems in it. And it's so exciting to think that instead of creeping our way 10% at a time towards solving these problems, that we could just slash big chunks of them out of the way. That's what excites me. So one of the things that I wanted to sort of get uh, you uh, with me on before I go off script is what a moonshot is. So moonshot thinking sounds like some kind of mantra, moonshot thinking. <laughs> That's not useful. Moonshot thinking, in my mind, technology moonshot thinking, by the way, I suppose it's possible, you know, Gandhi Salt March reasonably would count as a moonshot, but that's not the kind of moonshot that I'm talking about. A technology moonshot, in my mind, has these three basic components. Number one, you have to be able to point at a huge problem in the world and say, I want that problem to go away. If you don't have a problem, if you just have a frictionless surface, but you don't know what it's good for, that's not a moonshot, cool as a frictionless surface might be. So you can point at the problem. But that by itself is not enough. War is a huge problem in the world. But surely, you know, if I say that we're going to start a religion that's all about hugging people, you know, that might work. I don't know. But that's not a technology moonshot. So number two, there has to be some kind of science fiction sounding product or service that if you could make it would make the problem go away. So self-driving cars is sort of the poster child for this. You know, you can point at uh, 1.2 1 million people a year die in car accidents, a trillion dollars a year is wasted in traffic, people waste 10% of their lives sitting in cars, and you know, that's, that's the problem. Cars that drive themselves, that has to count as a science fiction sounding product or service that would make the problem go away. But a time machine has those same characteristics. Surely it would make lots of problems in the world go away. Surely that's got to be the poster child for a science fiction sounding product or service. But since I don't know how to start on one, we're not quite there yet. So the last piece of a great moonshot is that you have to have some reason to believe there's a glimmer of hope that you could actually do it. Because uh, you know when Kennedy said, let's put a man on the moon, nobody knew for sure it was possible. There were tons of. Uh, unsolved science and engineering problems still to be done, but there was just enough that had been done that through the Gemini uh, project and then through the Apollo missions, we actually did put somebody on the moon. And that was incredibly inspirational for generations afterwards, not just because of the technology itself, but because if you point at something and say, that is something we're going to do, and then you get it done, then it makes it seem like other problems can go away and greening the planet, and ending world hunger, and ending uh, poverty on this planet, these are problems worth working on. In transportation, in energy, in agriculture, the world has no shortage of problems. So uh, one of the things that um, I, I got asked yesterday was how governments can take moonshots. So uh, let me tell you how we came to that piece of the question. So I, I have this experience where I talk to groups like you. Sometimes they're uh, small company CEOs. And I get this like, whatever, Astro, nice attitude. But uh, that's not really going to work for us. We don't have the resources. Big companies can take moonshots. It's nice for you to say as part of Google. But small companies can't take moonshots because we don't have any money. <laughs> Duh. But then when I go to the big company CEOs and I have the same conversation with them, they say, whatever, Astro, nice attitude. But we can't take moonshots. You just ranted to us about taking big risks, about thinking bigger. We're a big company. That's not what we do. We buy innovation after it happens. You know, that we're not going to take risks. We have quarterly numbers to hit. That's for somebody else. That's not us. So then we, I go over to the academics. And I say, well, maybe you guys are going to take the moonshots. And they say, well, um, uh, we talk about moonshots, but we're not actually going to build one. So then I go to the governments. And they say, yeah, we love moonshots. We love telling the private sector that they should take moonshots. 
oh, oh, you want us to do that? No, no. That was like 50, 70 years ago we were doing that, but we don't do that anymore. This is almost independent of the government you talk to. They, they say, nope, not really our thing. You know, you're talking about going 10 times bigger instead of 10% bigger. We're just trying to hold the status quo, like 1x is all that we can manage right now. Everybody thinks it's somebody else's job. Everybody thinks that they can't do it, even though they hope that somebody else can. That's part of the secret of moonshot thinking, is it's not about how much money you have. It's not about how many smart people you have. It's about bravery and creativity. It requires having vision that something can be solved with the technical foundation, not that solves that problem from the beginning, but that just gives you enough reason to believe that it's not blind faith. And then you go do it. And I don't believe that there's any of those four groups that can't do it. Honestly, of those four groups, the only one that has some excuse would be academia, because arguably it might not be fair to graduate students around the world for the professors to be taking moonshots, because it might require that the graduate students spend less time getting publications and spend more time actually building something. Not necessarily a bad thing for the world, but if they want to go on and be professors, maybe that's not going to do their careers any good service. The people who have the least excuse are the big companies. This is now off my script, but that's why I wanted to rant to you guys about this. The big companies are the ones that, that drive me the most crazy. Because if I tell you that you have two choices, and this is kind of how moonshot thinking works. So you get cho choice A or choice B. Choice A, you could give a billion, a million dollars, one million dollars worth of bottom line value to your business next year, 100% guaranteed. Or choice B, you could give a billion dollars of bottom line value to your business next year, but in the first case, choice A, you have a 100% chance of doing it. In the second chance, you only have one chance in 100, a 1% chance, but it's a billion dollars in choice B, it's a million dollars in choice A. So show of hands, who here would choose choice A? All right, I'm a choice B. <laughs> Other people abstaining? <laughs> So obviously choice B is the right answer. It's got 10 times the expected utility of choice A. Now imagine, wherever you are, imagine going to your president, your prime minister, your CEO, your board of directors, and saying, I'm going to spend the next year on something with a 99% chance of being completely worthless and a 1% chance of delivering a billion dollars to our organization or whatever. Now, you might have to scale that up if you're in the government. But it's the same argument. They absolutely will say no. So you've all just identified as moonshot thinkers, but you're not in a context that would let you do that. Large uh, organizations, both governments and big businesses, can afford to do this. So a, a small entrepreneur could say, I only get one shot, Astro. So I just, I want to hit a double. OK, whatever. I guess, you know, if you're tolerance for zero is really low, then I understand if you only get one shot. But if you get hundreds of shots, which large companies do, it makes no sense not to put a lot of those shots into the choice B category. Because assuming that they're statistically independent events, and you can make them by giving different people the shots, betting in different industries that have different kinds of 1% chances of working out. You'd be crazy to put all of your eggs in the choice A basket, which is what almost all large corporations and all governments do. It's completely nonsensical. So corporations, I think, have the least excuse because they're motivated. They don't have other issues that they have to deal with, like the public good, um, whereas so that they really can count uh, doubling as being worth something relative to going down by half, whereas a government has a very low tolerance for any kind of decrease in the public good. So I understand that, but even so, there are things that governments can do. Uh, I gave an example yesterday, which I'll give to you, but I would be happy to talk more about this. And I don't have the answers, but I think it was a really interesting question. So someone raised their hand at the end of Zeitgeist and said, what can governments do to take moonshots? So my first answer, which I uh, agree, I, I believe, having thought about it for a day, is, well, I don't always agree with myself after a day. <laughs> um, 
you know, in the United States, there's a long-term capital gain. So if you invest in a business and a public company and you hold it for a year and a day, then you get the lowest, the best tax treatment you can on the increment in the, your investment, which is, I think, 20% right now. So this is long-term capital gains. But one year is not long-term relative to a moonshot. Moonshots, almost by definition, are going to take a lot longer than a year. You'd be lucky if they play out in two or three years, and mostly they're probably going to take 10. So if, let's say, the United States government were to set the long-term capital gains, the one-year threshold, at 30% instead of 20%, but tell investors that if they hold their money in a business for five years, they can have 10%. That's all we're gonna charge them if they hold it for, for five years. What is that gonna do? First of all, I bet that on balance, if you pick those numbers right, it's net neutral or maybe even positive to the US government. Didn't cost them a penny. I mean, they'll have to you know, have people freak out because someone won't like it. But from an actual finance perspective, that's you know, from a revenue perspective, it's not bad for the government. Number two, the corporations will very quickly see that the average length of time that people hold their stock goes up by a factor of three or four or five. It will go from roughly a year to four or five years. And immediately, the board of directors of all the corporations in America will start saying, how can we maximize shareholder value over the time horizon, which has just radically changed, that our current shareholders are, are looking at us for? So now they're gonna think over five years and over one year, and they're gonna take more moonshots. That is a way that government can help moonshots to happen without just shoveling money at the problem. And there have been examples in the past where government have, have taken some of the best moonshots in history. So uh, Bletchley Park here in the UK was one of the best moonshots ever taken, the you know, creation of modern computer science and modern cryptography. The Manhattan Project in the United States and the harnessing of the atom was one of the great ones. The Great Wall of China um, certainly counts as a moonshot. Um, the aqueducts that brought all the water into Rome, which really allowed Rome to turn into the superpower it was at the time. But all of these were military in nature. The exigency that was brought to them, it's great. You want to collect great people together and give them the pressure to go really fast but also the permission to be as weird as necessary in order to get radically better things done, to make the world radically better. But when war is the reason you're trying to do it, radically better gets kind of twisted in terms of what counts as radically better. I think, I don't know about uh, the Great Wall of China, actually there probably were some interesting innovations that happened in that process. But certainly the other three examples we have as a world benefited from greatly, as we did with the Apollo 11 mission to the moon. All of those were great for the world. But why do we have to wait for a war? Why can't we get amazing people together, together and say, don't do 10%, go 10x. Make something radically better, because when you push them, to go like that, whether you're a corporation, whether you're a government, even in a small company. When you tell someone, go make things 10% better, you're telling them, you know what? Everyone's basically been right. Let's just stand on our shoulders and see if we can peek up a little bit higher. It's, you're not gonna see anything new. And what's worse, if you make things slightly better, you're in a resources contest, a smartness contest with everybody else on the planet. So you're probably not gonna win. But if you tell your people, you have to do 10 times better. 10% better doesn't count. Better that you do nothing at all. Imagine if, if I came to you and I said, that's your job. For whatever it is that the project is, we have to make um, energy at one-tenth the price of coal. Well, I guess it's not going to be coal, <laughs> right? You have to start over. And the process of starting over changes your perspective. It forces you to tear up the rule book and try something radically new. And that doesn't always work, but the reality is that, remember choice A, choice B? In choice A, you got it 100%. Choice B, it was one chance in 100, but it was worth 1,000 times as much. But it's not 100 times as hard. Sometimes it's literally easier because of that perspective shifting. So even if it was, uh, 100 times as hard, you still get better returns by choosing choice B. But I'm telling you, and I've seen this over and over again now, it's better. 
So I could uh, rant like this for hours, but I think I've given myself enough of a head start. What I would suggest is that we now uh, do some questions, because I'd be happy to sort of rant and riff on some things that you guys find interesting. Sound good? Good. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much, Moonshots. Um, uh, I, I guess I could just mention CERN. Have you come across CERN? Yes. I mean, that's completely funded by governments. Absolutely. And is remarkable. True. One of the greatest um, coalitions of science anywhere on Earth. No, no, no question. So look, I have uh, a deep physics background, uh, not personally, but in my family. I have a great love of physics. So personally, I adore CERN. I, I get on YouTube constantly and sort of look at the latest things and the sort of God particle and how we're doing. And I, I can't tell you what a nerd I am for CERN and the work that's happening at CERN. So don't take this in the wrong way. But I will just very gently ask the question, and this is not a criticism of basic science, but I said in my definition of moonshots that the first thing was that it was going to solve a huge problem in the world. I would love for someone to come to me from CERN and tell me what the enormous problem they're trying to solve is, because I have not heard that definition. That is not a criticism of basic science, but I question maybe a little bit whether that counts as a moonshot. Well, as a failed arts student, I don't want to get into the Higgs boson, but uh, I, I understand that if we understand the Higgs boson, we will understand how we are standing here. Absolutely. Uh, but for example, there's a huge project in, uh, well, actually in, in Europe, uh, also in, in um, Israel, and I know there's one in the United States, to map the human brain in a lot more detail. I would not count that as a moonshot. That's like a meta moonshot. There is a hope that if we do that, then people can build moonshots on top of it. And I don't doubt that that's true, but my experience is that being able to point directly at a problem and say, let's do that. Yeah. Let's do one. Charles Arthur from The Guardian. Um, sorry, just to you and to on the old thing of what is the problem CERN is solving. OK, so they, uh, the problem they were solving is how do we coordinate a really, really, really big um, physics uh, systems so that we can find the Higgs boson. Uh, and some guy called Tim Berners-Lee figured out how to do that by inventing the World Wide Web there. So that's, um, surely that's your sort of answer. Right, actually I agree to the extent that it is explicitly an attempt to experiment and improve collaboration between governments and create large organizations that function well. That I'll sign up for as a moonshot. Amen. Totally. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> sorry, and, and I guess a real question I'd have is, um, obviously the first, the first moonshot was done by government. Um, and you say you need big problems. I mean, are there, what are the problems that you do see that commercial companies can grab a hold of, which are... You know, the low-hanging fruit of the moonshots, if you like. Um, I'm not sure they have to be uh, low-hanging, to be completely honest. I would say, what problems shouldn't the private sector work on? So the fact is that agriculture is not nearly as efficient as it could be. We have a massive energy uh, crisis and a global warming crisis on our hands. That would be worth the private sector tackling. I think we have serious challenges in healthcare. Uh, particularly the United States, spends a ridiculous amount of money per person on health care and gets horrible outcomes. But overall, in the world, people are getting older, and uh, we, th that means we have to take care of them for longer, and it's getting very expensive to do it. And we don't even get great outcomes anymore. We're sort of chipping away pretty ineffectively at it. So I would put health care uh, on the short list of problems for private industry to work on. Uh, transportation's a good one. I think that you know, self-driving cars would be awesome, but I don't think that that's the alpha and the omega of the issues around transportation. So for example, we spend a lot of our money moving big things around that's very different than a self-driving car. You know, the cargo ships, uh, tractor trailers, uh, trains, things like that. I, I think there's plenty of room to maneuver, to do something that is 10 times better in that space. The construction industry is a $6 trillion industry that creates something like 30% of the world's solid waste, 20% of the world's greenhouse gases, uh, and we just cannot, absolutely no question, cannot continue the way we're going. I mean, even if those weren't problems, we couldn't house everybody who's going to be born in the next 20 years or give them office space. It just doesn't, the math doesn't pencil out. So we have to completely reinvent the construction industry. The manufacturing industry is also seriously overdue for an update, as is com human-computer interactions, by the way. 
you know, you're typing right now on a QWERTY keyboard that was designed over 100 years ago to, for you to type slower. <laughs> and that's pretty amazing. That's a 10x waiting to happen. So, I, you know, I can give you some more, but I think those are some good ones. Three over here. Uh, hi, my name is Esko Renikan, and I'm growing innovation labs in local government. Thanks. Awesome. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we know where the problems are, and but um, what we don't, uh, what we're trying to get to a point is where culturally we're able to do moonshots. Um, so what I'm interested in is like in your experience, what you found are the most important cultural criteria that needs to exist in order for um, something like a government agency to be able to do the moonshot. Um, I'm gonna give you a really depressing answer and then maybe we can brainstorm together on a better one. Unfortunately, the depressing answer is probably the correct one. Go get yourself a Larry and a Sergey. Uh, the reason I, I think you know maybe the rest of us have done something useful at uh, Google X, and maybe we're sort of directionally correct, but we're only able to do what we can do because we have guidance and support from those two people, the founders of Google, because they, they don't just sort of believe in this, it's in their DNA. It's why search was out there for years before they started charging anybody, even advertisers for it, or Android, or Translate, or almost everything that Google has done. It's it's their nature to shoot for 10x. They have an incredibly high tolerance for um, moonshots, for the risk taking necessary for moonshots, and they get bored very easily by incremental progress. It happens that I think that they're right, uh, but I don't know, let me give you an example to sort of make this further depressing. So I, I will you know, get a room full of people, and you know, they say, please, you know, teach us about how to be innovative. And so I do the choice A, choice B experiment. How many people want choice A? Nobody raises their hand. How many people want choice B? Everybody raises their hand. And then I say, and I ask for a show of hands again, how many of you are in a context where you would be allowed to choose, choose choice B? Zero people in the room raise their hand. And then I say, you don't need a lecture in innovation. You need to quit your job. You're in the wrong context. So obviously, like everyone can't just quit their job because governments and large companies aren't inspirational. Somehow we have to do it from the inside. But I don't have a silver bullet for you. I think that the governments and the large organizations, and the small ones too, that are brave enough to see that it's more productive and sometimes literally easier to think bigger, to replace um, the competition of making something mildly better with the perspective shifting necessary to make something radically better, those are the ones in the sort of Darwinian way they're gonna fare better in the end. I, I, I would love a better answer if you have one. I seriously, because I'm gonna pass it on. Let, let's take number two. Hello, Graham Brown Martin, Education Design Labs. Um, you alluded earlier about the fairly enormous challenges that our species faces in the future. So I kind of wondered what a 10 times better education system would look like. I mean, would it embrace and nurture this moonshot thinking that you're talking about? Um, surely it's not Khan Academy and MOOCs. Um, well, uh, I'm not gonna say what I think uh, the answer is, and I'm not like I have the answer and I won't tell you, but. Uh, Mr. But, Microsoft gave us a good bit of the answer. <laughs> but but uh, let me give you a, a spin on that, which is, that the person who actually started Google X was a man named Sebastian Thrun. Larry and Sergey asked him to start it, and then he asked me to co-found it with him. Sebastian is no, no longer primarily at Google X because Sebastian felt really passionate about that particular moonshot. And uh, he suggested to Google that we take that moonshot. And I think Larry and Sergey were right in pointing out that that was one of the most important moonshots to take, A, Yes, we can all agree about that. You know, me, Sebastian, Larry, Sergey, I think we all agreed. But B, it's not fundamentally a technology problem. It's more of a social and pedagogic problem. It won't necessarily not use technology, but that the challenges are not primarily techn technical, and in that sense, maybe not properly set up for Google X. That does not mean that it's not a moonshot. Maybe it's a technical moonshot, but what Sebastian did was he went and he founded Udacity, which is arguably the leading MOOC, uh, and he is serious about fixing the education system. That's his way of trying to do it. He's a pretty serious moonshot thinker, so I personally would not bet against him. Um, if I had to put a bet somewhere right now on where the next radical fix in education is gonna come from, 
I'd put it on uh, Udacity for what it's worth. You, you mentioned earlier about um, the government finding a new uh, Larry or Sergey. I mean, do we have an education system, or will we have an education system, or will Udacity deliver an education system which finds those innovative and disruptive thinkers? I, I hope so. I'm not sure how much you can train people to have that attitude. Uh, it's been pointed out, I don't know if you, you probably don't have Montessori schools here in the UK. Oh, you do, okay. So both uh, Larry and Sergey went to Montessori schools. Coincidence, obviously they didn't go to the same Montessori school. They didn't know each other when they were kids. But it has been pointed out, and then that's very sort of play-oriented, very collaborative, and maybe that had something to do with it. Maybe there are ways that we can rewire education to help kids be excited about trying things more and less focused on just beating the person next to them by 2% on the test. Astra, I don't know if you were in yesterday for the Zeitgeist session with, uh, um, with Naomi Shah and uh, Jack, 18 and... 16 respectively, but they had taken two individual mind, uh, mm -hmm. moonshots and achieved, and they'd done so, one in Orlando, one in um, Portland, Oregon, and the other in Ohio, which suggests that somewhere in America it's possible to get educated. Well, uh, yes, but <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Look, I'm a, I'm a booster of the United States in general. I think the education system in the United States is failing the children of the United States almost universally. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, of the overall education system in the United States. Those two children who you just pointed out, both of them described while you were interviewing them that they taught themselves. They actually credited their parents, both of them, with leaving them alone. That's the only thing they gave their parents for, and I, I'm sure they loved their parents. And then they credited the schools with basically not you know, uh, putting them in detention for throwing spitballs and nothing better than that. They claim that they learned everything off the web. Mm. <laughs> so I, I think those are incredibly motivated, hyper bright kids. And to the extent that we can find uh, hyper bright kids and give them the right context where they can learn as fast as possible, awesome. But I don't think that straight chairs and straight rows is necessarily the way. It didn't work for them. So I wouldn't bet on it in general. Three. Uh, Guy Herb. Guy Herbert, no to ID. Um, I want to disagree with something fundamental that you said at the beginning, uh, which is that governments don't take moonshots. Governments, in fact, take moonshots all the time. Governments attempt to transform the world and take enormous bets, and the results are almost universally terrible. <laughs> How do we stop them doing that? That's an interesting question. So uh, I, I'll half agree with you. Um, I think that governments shoveling money at specific problems um, has not historically been the best way for things to get solved. And, and weirdly, I don't think it's because that can't work, because at least in these military examples, when governments get really serious about figuring stuff out, they're shockingly effective. <laughs> but historically, I think on balance, you're right. But that doesn't mean that they can't help promote the things that they want to see happen. And there are lots of ways to do that. You can deregulate things. You can change your tax policies. There are ways that governments can uh, organize themselves or help other people to be organized, which promote taking moonshots. And if I could cheer on uh, government to do one thing, it would not necessarily be to create the, the moonshot itself, but to take personal responsibility for enabling more moonshots. So w w I, I agree with you that uh, their role would be best served not directly taking the moonshot, but by enabling them. One last question to him, uh, from number one, please. Hi, uh, my name is Jim Godfrey. I've worked in, uh, in government and in business. And I think, I mean, you talked about warfare as a as a kind of a factor in driving some of these things. And also, I mean, I always see it as a competition, really. And one of the reasons that you know, Kennedy said what he said, it was about competition, it was about doing it before someone else, the Russians, did. And it's, you, know, you see government has been funding a lot of these kind of competitions by setting up prizes, these big prize funds, through people like Nestor and others, to try and drive inventors to pit each, you know, individuals against each other to, to get there and using the competitive element. And, you know, what I've seen in, in business often is that, you know, almost like competition isn't enough. You can't get them to think to the kind of the 10 times rather than the, the 10%. And it's about how we encourage, you know, 
the private sector to be much more big picture in its kind of competition and in whether it's the kind of the innovation units or it's the R&D functions that, you know, getting them to think further and faster. And, you know, I'd be interested to see how you, how you see kind of Google X. Do you see it as you want to get there before the other guys or you want to get there just because you want to get there? Do you know, I, as you said the word X, it came up on the screen. Are you aware of that? Uh, so, I mean, yes, that is a big part of the issue. Uh, let me give you the following perspective. First of all, I just want to get to the future as fast as possible. I want the problems to go away. I wouldn't be spending my time evangelizing this way of thinking unless I really believed that the more people are, do it, uh, the more organizations do it, the faster we'll get to the best possible future. And I don't care whether Google does it or somebody else does it personally. Number two, we have a bunch of different moonshots that we're taking at Google X. And the single thing that I've found that's been the most effective is not telling someone that I'll make them personally wealthy if they get to some place, or pit one of the groups against the other for cool points in some kind of negative way. We made this steampunk trophy. It's this uh, you know, big metal, sort of uh, rusty looking sculpture about this big of a rocket ship. And every quarter, each one of the moonshot groups sets an audacious milestone for themselves. They get to set it, and they set them incredibly high, these quarterly milestones for themselves. And they tell it to all of the other groups. And it is for the pride of setting it as high as they can and for looking good relative to the other groups and, and to have the other groups be proud of them that they work incredibly hard for the entire quarter for the small chance, which they usually don't do, to hit that audacious milestone and get this rocket ship trophy that has no monetary value associated with it, and someone else is going to have it a quarter later. I believe that it's possible. So that's an example of uh, friendly and healthy competition, where there's no zero-sum game, nobody loses, everybody feels like they're in it together, but there's still something to be proud of if you accomplish something particularly strong. They get to set their own goals, and amazingly, instead of sandbagging it, and so that they're sure to hit it. They set goals. There are many quarters where we have many moonshots that we're taking, and not a single one of them hits it. That's how high they're setting their goals. So I don't know how to do that across industries or across the world, but I believe that it's possible because I've seen it in microcosm. Astro Teller, thank you very much. Thank indeed. you very much. Thank you.